Let's read together our text for this evening. Luke 7, verses 29 through 35. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. But the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine liver, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of all her children. Beloved, it is some time since the last sermon on John the Baptist. It's over a month, and to be precise, five weeks. But I trust after all that time, you can remember where we are in John the Baptist's life. Remember that he has been imprisoned by Herod Antipas at Machaerus, whence he sent two disciples to Jesus with the question, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And we considered at some length Christ's profound and appropriate answer. In the last sermon on John, we saw how the Lord Jesus, after John's two messengers departed, we saw how the Lord Jesus defended John's character and explained John's office. Tonight, Jesus isn't speaking to the crowd about John the Baptist. He is speaking to the people about themselves. More specifically, he is speaking to them about their response to John. They rejected him. And their response even to Jesus himself. And I should say that after this sermon, the next scene in John's public ministry is finally his beheading. Then we shall learn that John is not only rejected by the people, right, but he is ultimately executed by Herod. Next time, Lord Lord. For now, let's consider John's rejection by the people. First, the illustration. Second, the corollary, or the accompanying truth. And third, the exceptions. John's rejection by the people. The illustration, the corollary, and the exceptions. Our text this evening sets forth the incarnate Son of God, Jesus Christ, as an observant man. He noticed the children. He watched their games. He knew that sometimes they would play in the marketplaces, that is, after the traders had left, because there they have, all to themselves, a big open playground. And maybe you can remember when you were a child that there were certain large areas where you used to play games that required some space. Now amongst the games that children play are those games which involve the imitation of adult life. Because God has built it into children that they imitate their parents and grown-ups, whether for good or for ill. And so the Lord Jesus saw the children play at weddings, the wedding game. And on such occasions, the children 
imitating the adults. One of them would play on a flute or a little whistle, and then the other children would dance because that's what they saw the grown-ups do at their weddings. At other times, Jesus saw the children in the marketplaces playing not at weddings, happy occasions, but funerals, sad occasions. No happy strains with a whistle or flute now, no dancing. Instead, some of the children would imitate the professional mourning women because in Christ's day, and even yet in the Middle East, there are professional mourning people. And you would hire these people, and they would come in and make lamenting sounds to advance the weeping of the other people. It's not our custom, but it's what they did in Jesus' day. So the idea would be then that in this game, some of the children would play the part of the professional mourning women with their lamentable cries and then the other children would follow suit and weep too. And the Lord saw this and he evidently filed this away in his memory for use later. And eventually the day came Verse 31, the Lord said, How am I going to liken the people of this generation? What are they like? What illustration could set forth clearly their behavior? He knew the illustration. He had one to hand. This was part of his wisdom. For he was one wiser than Solomon. And so he said, this is what they're like. They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another, just as I've seen them do it, and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. And here Jesus is saying, We came and piped to you at the wedding, but you, you didn't dance. And then he played funeral. We mourned, but you didn't mourn. And then Jesus explains and applies his illustration in verses 33 and 34. He explains in verse 33 that John the Baptist's ministry was somewhat like the funeral game. John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking wine, and ye say, he hath a devil. You didn't really repent. You didn't really weep over your sins. Instead, you rejected John. <coughs> On the other hand, Christ's own ministry was more like the wedding game. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and ye say, ah, he's a glutton. Oh, he's a drunkard, a friend of publicans and sinners. And Jesus came as the bridegroom proclaiming the gospel and the coming of the kingdom of God. They didn't rejoice and they didn't dance, but they called them names. You're like the children in the market. And there are some interesting points here about the people's rejection of John the Baptist. The people actually criticized and rejected John on the basis of things for which they originally admired him and went out to hear him. Remember, as we saw last time, Christ is speaking to people who journeyed out into the desert to listen to John preach. Verse 24, he asks the people, What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? No. You went out to see a man whom you knew fine well to be constant, rock solid, steadfast. Verse 25. But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Huh. Men like that sit in king's courts. 
You know fine well you went out to see a man dressed in camel skin. A man who very obviously practiced what he preached as a preacher of repentance. And to follow this line, the people were also attracted to John because of his diet. They knew, verse 33, what John ate. John came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, locusts and wild honey. A pointer to his office as a preacher of repentance. They came to John too because of his Nazarite office. He didn't drink wine, which was one part of the threefold Nazarite vow explained in Numbers chapter 6. And so John wouldn't even touch or sip wine or even the fruit of the vine at all. He wouldn't even eat a grape because the Nazarite law pointed to the fact that we're to be holy to God, dedicated to him, without even any appearance or possibility of sin in this regard. But now it is that even for the things that they formerly admired in John, they use against him. They went out to the wilderness because of his steadfastness, his camel skins, his diet, his being a Nazarite, all in connection with this preaching of repentance, but now it's used against him. John the Baptist, this is what they're saying, came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, he hath a devil. Now you say he is demon possessed. That's the explanation for his diet. He's possessed by a demon. John the Baptist is like the various sick people whom you meet in the Gospels, foaming at the mouth or throwing themselves into fire or paralyzed because of demon possession, like one of the two Gadarene demoniacs. That's what they say about John. criticized and rejected him for the very things that they used to admire in him. It's also significant that they criticized and rejected John despite the fact that many of them professed to have been converted under his ministry. Verse 29 says, All the people that heard him and the publicans or tax collectors justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. And doubtless, some of the people to whom Christ was then speaking had earlier been amongst the hordes that went out to hear John preach and that submitted to his baptism. That is, the people to whom Jesus is speaking included a number of those, at the very least, who had acknowledged that John was a prophet. Verse 26. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yeah. Yeah, and I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. These people had acknowledged too that John's preaching was the preaching of a prophet. These people had professed, or at least many of them had, to repent of their sins, and so, in accordance with John's preaching, they had claimed to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance, upon which testimony they had been baptized with water by John. And verse 29 says that by being baptized by John, they had justified God. Verse 29. All the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. And that phrase, being baptized, in this connection means 
they justify God by being baptized. This is a useful verse, by the way, to file away in the dispute over the nature of justification. Justification, according to biblical and reformed teaching, is legal, exclusively legal. That is the Protestant and reformed view. To justify means to declare righteous. The Roman Catholic view, you will remember, means the Roman Catholic view of justification is that it means to make righteous. So Rome says that we are justified by being made righteous, by being changed from within. Which of course is a hopeless gospel because we never become perfect. But the reform said no, and this was Luther's great biblical insight, justification is legal. And this is a proof that justification is legal because people cannot make God righteous. God already is perfectly, infinitely righteous. But people can declare God to be righteous. And the church justifies God, declares that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is perfectly righteous. But we can't make him righteous. And our criticism of the Roman Catholic false gospel is that they can no more make God to be more righteous than he already is than they can make a sinner righteous so that the sinner can stand before God even in part by his own righteousness. And so it is, returning more specifically to the point of this sermon, when the people acknowledged John as a prophet, accepted his preaching as the word of God, professed to repent, and submitted to baptism, they were justifying God and saying, God is righteous in sending this man to preach this message and administer this baptism. And that's what the people used to do. That's what they did a few months ago. But now, say a year or so later, now they say, not that John is the messenger sent by God, that God is righteous by bringing his preaching and his baptism. Now they say, John is possessed by a demon. He wasn't called and equipped by the Holy Spirit. He wasn't filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. No, his life, his preaching, and his baptism is of the devil, Satan himself. That's what they're saying about John the Baptist. Do you remember who else the Jews said had a devil? The Lord Jesus Christ himself. And in Matthew 10, verse 25, Jesus said, It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master or teacher, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house, Beelzebub, another name for Satan, how much more shall they call them of his household? And they call John Satanic. Who? In the next verse, Luke 7, verse 30, says that the Pharisees and the lawyers were at least consistent in their hatred of John. They hated John right from the start, and they hated him all the way through, and they still hated him. Verse 30, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. The Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God. Here the counsel of God means the will of God's command. I'm not going to listen to John. I'm not going to be baptized by him. Not chance. They rejected the counsel of God against themselves to their own disadvantage by not being baptized of him. They hated Christ, hated John the Baptist consistently from the start. But the people here professed to love and follow him. 
And then, a year or so later, said that John was filled with demons. And this is a classic biblical example showing how changeable <coughs> and fickle these Jews were. Here's John the Baptist from every side, an amazing man in his diet and dress as a Nazarite and a prophet. The people listened to his preaching and they submitted gladly to his baptism. A year passes and see that boy John the Baptist out in the wilderness. We're all convinced, we're sure of it. He's possessed by the devil. And just to remain on the perversity and twistedness line, here they are, crowding around Jesus, watching his miracles, and hearing him preach. And at the same time, even while they're in Jesus' presence, they really say about him, you know he's a glutton, and a drunkard, and a friend of sinners. So to return to the illustration, John had mourned to them, but they didn't really weep. They were like silly, self-willed children. They're out in the playground and they take the hump and just won't play ball, won't join in the game. And there comes John the Baptist lamenting, calling to weep. And in this game they say, no, I don't feel like it. I'm not joining in. I'm not going to play today. And you know it's even more twisted. After John the Baptist is dead, the Jews then called him a prophet. Everybody was convinced John's a prophet. Go figure. A couple of years before, they said he was demon possessed. A year before that, they thought he was the greatest thing in 400 years and submitted to his baptism. And even when they do call him a prophet, Matthew 21 verse 24 refers to that, they still didn't listen to what he preached. In fact, some of them, after John died, not only reckoned that John was a prophet, but they actually reckoned that Jesus Christ was John the Baptist risen from the dead. The same man whom they said was possessed by the devil. Go figure. And of course, it's not just totally to pray of Jews, as if the Jews have a monopoly on sin. They don't. It's the truth of total depravity. It's universal. Jews and Gentiles, every nation. Totally to pray of Gentiles are just as fickle. And the Apostle Paul especially saw that in his first missionary journey at Lystra in Acts chapter 14. There was a man who was a cripple from his mother's womb. Paul, by the power of God, heals the man. The people in Lystra cry out, the gods are come down to us in the form of men. Paul was divine. He was a god. And then some Jews from Antioch and Iconium come down and tell the people in Lystra who had claimed that Paul was a god. And they poured some poison into their ears. And the next thing, the same people grab stones and stone Paul to death and drag them out of the city. But God raised him back <clears throat> to health. And the Christian church has always seen this fickleness. Because everything that's written in the scriptures is written for our learning, upon whom the ends of the world are come. We have seen this in our history too, over more than two decades. We have people who have moved house to join us. We have had office bearers. We have had some people who were extremely zealous that you would wonder if the Apostle Paul was maybe going a bit cold. We have had people who have made great sacrifices in their lives and families for the biblical and reformed faith. And now, some of them are atheists or sought to disband the church, or spread lies about us, or attack the reformed faith and creeds which they once claimed to hold dearer than life. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain 
in the Lord. You must not be carried about by every wind of doctrine or any wind of doctrine. You must be steadfast and unmovable in the reformed faith till the day you die. That's the calling of Scripture. But if we want the greatest example, at least the greatest example that appears to me in Scripture, of man's fickleness, it is seen especially at the cross. On Palm Sunday, the crowd outside Jerusalem's gates, and representing the Jews, cried out, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! And then on Good Friday, Five days later, the crowd before Pilate, and representing the Jews, cried out, Crucify him, crucify him, and his blood be upon us and our children. Less than a week. And our passage explains that it was those who rejected and slandered John the Baptist who also rejected and slandered Jesus Christ. And of course, there's a necessary connection there. You can't have somebody who really thinks that John the Baptist is a messenger from God, but who doesn't believe in Jesus. You can't have somebody who believes in Jesus, but rejects the ministry of John the Baptist, because the two go hand in glove. Jesus and John the Baptist were motivated by the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Although Jesus was the incarnate Son of God, filled with the Spirit without measure. <clears throat> John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And so, regarding John, we read the people saying, He has a devil, since he doesn't eat or drink, the way most people do. And that the Son of Man, <coughs> coming eating and drinking, is a glutton, a wine bibber, and a friend of publicans and sinners. Or to return to the imagery or illustration, John the Baptist mourned and the people didn't weep. Oh, we're not into this weeping. No, 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 we don't like that. Not into weeping. Okay. Then Jesus came and he piped and he said, okay now, let's sing, let's dance. Oh, we don't feel like dancing now either. That'd be too energetic. We don't feel happy enough to dance. This is significant because in this passage it is not favoritism that's the sin. It's not that they're playing one off against another. It's not that they like Jesus but don't like John. It's not that they put down John in order to praise Jesus. Or that they like John but don't like Jesus and put down Jesus to make John look good. Rather, in this passage the sin is that of hitting both John the Baptist and Jesus. And so they slander both, drunkard, demon possessed, and they reject both. We don't want John and we don't want Jesus either. And so the sin we're dealing with now is not fickleness. We saw fickleness in the people who <coughs> used to like John, who were his converts, so called, and now they hate him. The sin now is that of an evil, unreasonable disposition. Whatever John the Baptist does, that's wrong. Whatever Jesus does is wrong in the eyes of these people. If Jesus Christ eats and drinks moderately, well, he's obviously a glut. Well, he must be a drunkard. There you are, proved. And if on the other hand, John the Baptist takes no wine at all, and even though this is at the command of the angel Gabriel in Luke 1, it's sure proof that he must be possessed of a devil. And if John eats very little, locusts and wild honey, it is an absolute guarantee that he is satanic. And if John the Baptist leads a reclusive life, far away from the crowds, 
Obviously he has a demon. But if Jesus Christ is sociable and accepts invitations and goes for a meal when invited by, let's say, a Pharisee, as at the end of Luke 7, or a meal at the invitation of Levi, who was brought, or Levi invited some of his tax collector friends, Jesus went there. Well, then that's proof that he's a friend of theirs and that he really isn't holy at all, but he must be a sinner himself. And a particularly vile sinner, consorting with prostitutes and tax collectors, scum of our society. That's what the people thought. In our day, this is often the attitude of unbelievers after they reject the truth to which they have been exposed. And sometimes, too, it can even be the attitude of professing believers to give way to a critical disposition. You could say this describes someone who is hard to please, but actually it doesn't. This passage deals with people who are impossible to please. Jesus Christ, or John the Baptist, as we could say, could stand on their head and do anything imaginable, and it would be wrong. The disposition that's opposed here is of those who always want to find fault, who are never happy unless they're sniping. And if they have nothing negative to say, they have nothing to say. John the Baptist, sure he doesn't even eat right. The man, the man has a devil. Jesus Christ, he ate, he ate with the tax collectors. Oh, it wasn't that he was bringing the gospel to them. He must be a sinner. So everything is bad and only bad from beginning to end and top to bottom like the unbelieving Israelites in the wilderness. Because these people in Luke 7 were so holy and so godly. They were such wonderful Jews who stood for the old paths that they hated John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, the one who he sent. You see this too in the church. If a minister is of a certain age, he's wrong. If he's an older man, well then, he's no good for the children. If he's a younger man, well, he has no experience of life, so he really wouldn't be any use. And if the same man was older, or the older man was younger, there'd be something else against him. If a minister's sociability is such that he does a lot of visiting, well then they'll say, why is he in his study? His sermons are going to suffer. And if he doesn't do as much visiting, they're going to say, you know that man, he just needs to read books. He lacks a pastor's heart. There's no compassion there. And if the minister is happy or cheerful, saying, you know, something wrong with that man. There's a spirit of levity about him. On the other hand, if the same minister were to go about grief, sober, they'd say, you know, a bit gloomy that man. He kind of get you down. And so it goes. If the same minister preaches one Sunday on predestination and justification, there might be the suspicion that secretly he's an antinomian. He encourages loose living. And then in the evening service, if he preaches about a great, full, holy life, the third part of our Heidelberg Catechism, he's also too strict. And yet he's both things at the same time, but it really doesn't matter as long as we can get at him. And if he preaches on doctrine, oh, that's way too deep. That's not practical enough. But then if he preaches on something practical, oh, he's getting at me. This is what characterized the Jews to whom John the Baptist preached and then Jesus Christ 
It was an evil disposition. They were perverse. <coughs> whatever John did, whatever Jesus did, they were damned if they do, and they were damned if they don't. And my guess is, beloved, you have probably met such people in your own life. You probably have a neighbour like that in your street, or a person at work like that, or a guy at school that you can remember like that. And they're always negative. And there's nothing you can do to even bring them out of it because it's a matter of disposition. And after a while you think to yourself, you know, they even enjoy being critical. And if they weren't critical and negative, they wouldn't be happy. Because it's a matter of the heart. And in this passage, the evil disposition that unfairly attacked John the Baptist and Jesus Christ was indicative of a problem with God. The problem with these people was of God. They didn't like God. They professed to believe in him and follow him, but they didn't. They didn't like the God of mercy and judgment and truth. And they hated and slandered John and Jesus because they were enemies of God. And they hid this from themselves and from others by attacking the messengers, but by maintaining all along, we love God and we are faithful disciples of Moses. But thankfully, there were some exceptions. After Jesus' sharp word to his audience in Luke 7, 31 through 34, and the illustration of the children playing in the marketplace, they didn't dance when the pipes were played, they didn't mourn when the leader lamented. Jesus adds this, but wisdom is justified of all her children. Now there's one interpretation of this which says that wisdom is God. So God, the wise God, is justified of all her children. And the phrase, her children, means John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. Which means that God is justified and declared to be righteous by John the Baptist and by Jesus Christ. Even though the people didn't declare God just. That would actually make sense and is true in what it teaches, but I don't believe this, that is the idea of the text. Instead, wisdom is indeed God, or some would say wisdom is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is called the wisdom of God, or it's the gospel. Or you could put it all together and say essentially the same thing. <coughs> Wisdom here refers to the only wise God who is known solely through the gospel of Jesus Christ, his Son. And then, wisdom's children are the true, elect, believing remnant in Israel. They're children of God, the children of Christ, the children of the gospel. And then, it would be that the elect children of God declare <coughs> that the only wise God in his gospel in Jesus is just and right and fair and good. But this is, beloved, what the true church does and has always done through all ages. In spite of the fickle crowds who used to be for John and who are now against him, in spite of the perverse crowds who slander and hate John and Jesus Christ, wisdom's children say, you have it all wrong. You have it all wrong. John the Baptist is not possessed by a demon at all. And it's perverse of you even to suggest it. He's great in the eyes of the Lord, as the angel Gabriel said in Luke 1, He's a great prophet in my eyes. That's what the Christian says. 
And the Jesus Christ, whom John the Baptist preached, was certainly no glutton. And he wasn't a drunkard either. And instead, you should be saying, look at the meekness of God in Christ. He fellowships with poor, wretched sinners. He goes into their home and eats with them and witnesses to them. He behaves himself wisely and graciously in their presence. And he's doing this to convert others, their friends, who come to the table at the invitation of their friend. And this Jesus sups with me in the gospel and he dines with me through the word of God and by faith. And I fellowship with him. I know this Jesus. Yeah, he does. He does eat with sinners. He is the friend of sinners. He's a friend of saved sinners. All saved sinners. And this friendship with saved sinners, we have a theological word for it. We call it the covenant of grace. In which God becomes our friend and fellowships with us in the covenant through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we come to him. And we know him as such. And we say that God is righteous. God is righteous. That's writ large over all the history of John the Baptist that we've been studying the past few months. And in all of his dealings with Jesus Christ, especially on the cross, where the righteousness of God is especially seen, and through which the just live by faith. So it is that those who justify God in Jesus Christ thereby show that they are the ones who are justified by God in Jesus Christ. Amen.